So, hi, um, my name's Steve Haynes. Um, I'm a body worker. Um, it's a really important identity for me. I work with pain, trauma, uh, anxiety by helping people connect to their body. So I like movement. I get people shaking to help people feel connected to their body. Uh, I do a lot of education. I write comic books and talk a lot into the ether like this. Uh, but touch is my primary tool. Uh, I'm a touch therapist, first and foremost. I teach two-year programs around touch. Uh, cranial sacral therapy is the modality I use. I trained in shiatsu, uh, trained in chiropractic, uh, bits of massage along the way. Uh, three years shiatsu training, that was a really deep training for me. Uh, that was my first serious bodywork training. I really liked it, but I could never quite feel energy in the way it was constructed in the shiatsu framework. Um, there were many rich and beautiful things there. Really, my first exposure to Zen philosophy and Taoist thought, the less you do, the more seems to happen. That's maybe one thing we're going to look at today, the power of non-doing touch or effective touch, or I'm going to call it relational touch. So we'll look at all of that, um, uh, different types of touch and the style of touch I've arrived at via cranial sacral therapy that I'm calling effective touch. Uh, mimicking a researcher called Francis McGlone, or most of the time I call it um, relational touch. So yeah, Shetsu though was a lovely way for me of learning to touch, pressing points, stretching, working on the floor, quite vigorous sometimes, quite gentle sometimes. But somehow the construct of energy in that world didn't quite suit me. I wanted more status, so I trained as a chiropractor that took me five years. Uh, I thought chiropractic, uh, again, was a really rich training for me. Uh, the philosophy was uh, to straighten the spine, maybe, and we could diagnose by touching. So one of the key skills I learned was to run my fingers up and down a spine and learn to assess the spine. So using my hands to diagnose alignment and the shape of the body with the notion, the underlying philosophy, that the shape and the form of the body was important. And if we could change the shape, if we could align the spine, um, that would eliminate pain or help people function better. So again, that's something I moved away from as a philosophy. I don't think alignment is a determination or a, an important factor in pain these days. It's not inconsequential, but it's not the defining most important thing. So shiatsu, chiropractic, rich traditions, and I got a lot from it, but I really came home in the world of body work and touching when I discovered um, cranial sacral therapy and particularly biodynamic cranial sacral therapy. For me, this is the art of touch, the ability to do less, but achieve more. Uh, I think it's an extraordinary paradigm. And Part of this lecture is really going to be a celebration of the slow touch, uh, touch that's inherently emotional, touch that meets a whole per and a, a person and attempts to honour all the stories that can emerge inside that person that are facilitated by the power of touch. I'm going to be talking purely about touch for about an hour and then moving in more to biodynamic cranial sacral therapy and some of the central features of that model for the last half hour. Let me just set up a screen share here. So kind of four sections to the touch, uh, to this lecture on touch. Why touch is essential for humans. The notion of inward touch and outward touch. And actually learning they're not that different, really. What's happening on the inside of us and how we touch inwards, how we sense inwards, uh, is determinative of how we touch outwards and how we make sense of the world and how we interpret what we touch. So we're going to look at that. And that's quite a geeky section. We're going to look at some nerves and membrane receptors and just look at the, the kind of the sensitivity of nerves throughout the body, not just at their receptors. So yeah, inward touch, outward touch, inward sensing, outward sensing, incredibly interrelated and very hard to separate out. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really meaty section, a little bit complex with some of the neurology, but hopefully I'll make it simple enough for you folks. 
Well, look at the limits of touch. Um, I was on the tube today in London and there was this big sign saying touching and then touching is sexual harassment as a sign, you know, if you touch people inappropriately, then this is sexual harassment. Yes, absolutely. But gosh, that was quite hard just to see that's the representation or quality of touch that we need to enforce, I guess, on, on the tube system in London. When I looked at it, I thought, gosh, you're talking about groping and harassment, but you're framing it as touch. And unfortunately for me, somehow lumping all sorts of things into the word touching that makes it quite hard to make touch a soft, safe, normal thing for people. So yeah, some of the fears around touch are really prevalent in our culture. And we'll look at that, how it impacts therapy, particularly psychotherapy, but we'll also look at why we can use touch and trauma. Why I'm going to offer it's one of the key tools for helping people out of overwhelming and difficult experiences. So there's some good guidelines about how to make touch work. We'll also look at some philosophies that aren't great around touch, the idea that you can diagnose, the alignment and position, meaning three through touch, that's not so great really. Um, but what can we do with touch and what's the research around the limits and the power of touch? And then the fourth section, yeah, this notion just really reinforcing uh, what works in touch. Um, there's a really nice paper that summarizes three elements of touch. And we'll just look at the, the data from that paper or the summary of that paper around the type of touch that seems to have an effect, having looked at the limits of touch previously. Uh, this is me, this is my lockdown project. Uh, touch is really strange. Um, uh, here's a review from Joella Belton. She's someone I admire hugely. She's a, uh, an amazing pain educator now, but she was a firewoman who came from a chronic pain experience. And uh, yeah, she said some nice things about the book. And uh, yeah, it's out there and you can buy it on the internet and bookshops. Let me just have a pause just to make sure everybody's hearing me. Uh, I'm gonna check the chat um, every so often. Um, so I'll pause three, four times in the lecture, just like this, just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, one of the requests from the previous webinars is to keep the chat uh, quite focused on the lecture. So not too much extraneous stuff going on in the chat, please, if I may. And if you do have a question, put it in the chat and I'll try and get around to it or I'll pause at some stage. Okay, why touch is essential for humans? I think this is an extraordinary picture. Breaks down all sorts of stereotypes for me. Um, and clearly I'm thinking this is from Afghanistan and uh, uh, someone caring for someone else and not much happening, but also something extraordinary happening in terms of touch as a gesture of compassion, support, love, all sorts of things happening in this picture. Really, really powerful image, I think. Let's look at this baby. This is a baby. Um, I think it's 10 days old, very, very early in its life and responding to touch uh, with pure delight. So look at just the expressions and we can't help but be moved and touched by that. Let's watch it again. I kind of watch this endlessly, this one. So soft, gentle stroking generates all these signs of joy and connection, that bliss going on there. Amazing. Here's another one of uh, twins. Twins have an extraordinary bond sometimes, often um, growing and touching very early on. Uh, we're always being shaped by touch, I'm going to offer. Twins have a very particular notion of that. Uh, some twins don't get on. It's good to good to acknowledge that. It's not always an easy relationship, but uh, look at this. This is a mother and two babies who've just been born uh, on the breast right now. But look at the first gesture of the babies. There you go. Here you go. Better? We ordered two. <laughs> oh, look at them holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow. Oh my God, you guys are making me cry. How cute is that? Isn't that amazing? So, just been born, grown up together, and supporting each other by touching. I have to reach quite far to do that, so just phenomenal. Good, so we know that touch is really, really important for the growth of human beings, the growth of babies. Here's some very clear evidence from um, the world, uh, from UNICEF. So they promote, based on research, skin-to-skin -skin contact between mother and baby and mother, uh, mother and caregivers. So the research shows that skin-to-skin -skin contact calms and relaxes both mother and baby. It regulates the baby's heart rate and breathing, enables colonization of friendly bacteria and reduces cortisol stress levels, particularly follow painful, following painful procedures. So really gold standard evidence. This is now recommended worldwide by uh, international organizations. Skin to skin contact helps babies thrive and grow. There's actually another intervention called kangaroo care, where preterm babies in the research live longer, have better health outcomes if they're just strapped uh, in a pouch like a kangaroo strapped in a pouch skin to skin and just carried around on the mother or caregiver's uh, chest. So yes, kangaroo care saves preterm babies' lives. And actually it's even better than that. The, this intervention has only been around for 10, maybe 15 years. So they're doing the first follow-up studies. So children at 10 years old who had skin to skin contact and kangaroo care uh, are more socialized, uh, have better health outcomes, are better able to regulate their emotional framework, more pro-social. So really great long lasting benefits of uh, touch and particularly early touch, skin to skin contact for babies, helps babies thrive. And there's really nice evidence on the type of touch that we can also add into skin to skin. And this is human infants positive respond to slow, gentle stroking. Now we're gonna learn that there's two types of touch and two types of receptors for touch. There's slow touch and quick touch. Slow touch is received and coded by these C nerve fibers that we're gonna look at a quite lot later. So this research is that slow touch stimulates these C fibers and babies have more eye contact, they smile more, more positive vocalizations and are less stressed. Excellent, very clear, very strong evidence that slow, gentle touch and skin to skin contact helps babies thrive and grow. Unfortunately, we also have evidence of the reverse. The absence of touch can lead to very poor health outcomes. Here's uh, Francis McGlone, he's kind of a crazy English scientist, a crazy looking English scientist. Uh, he's really lovely to talk to. He did some amazing research, uh, first published, I believe in 2014, on slow touch and C fibers. And he talks or quotes or hints that um, links between the lack of C fiber touch and autism. Many people with autism find gentle touch uncomfortable, hinting at underlying abnormalities in C fiber systems. And also he states that um, there's less touch in some neonatal intensive care units. Uh, the touch is obviously limited in these situations. Around one in four infants go on to develop autism. So that's hints in the data. It's not really clear evidence, but he's a professor, a kind of respected researcher, talking about the links of lacking the lack of touch and difficulties of touch being associated with uh, autism. There's also some really, really devastating evidence on the lack of touch from Romania. So in the 1980s, Romanian orphanages were a cultural phenomenon. Most of the children weren't actually orphans, but they were put in these institutions. And in some of them, they received hardly any touch from the nurses. And 
this lack of touch was demonstrated to be a feature of the mental health issues and physical health issues that many of these children suffered throughout their lives. They did an amazing uh, experiment within the orphanages. There were nurses who were known not to touch. If they swapped them with nurses who did touch, the, in the new orphanage, uh, the children fared worse with a nurse who didn't touch. And the, in, the other, in the reverse orphanage, the children started getting better with the nurses who did touch. Never to be repeated experiment, but it's very famous that lack of touch led to poor health outcomes in the children. So we need touch. We need touch as babies. We need touches as we're growing. We also need touch as when we get older. It's uh, indicated, um, there's some data and evidence I quote in my book, that old people fare worse without touch. More isolation, more sense of isolation, more depression, uh, less able to move, uh, all associated with a lack of touch. So we need it when we grow and come out of the uh, birth canal, come into the world, and we need it when we're old. We've gone through a massive experiment in touching and uh, not touching over the last um, two, three years in the pandemic. This is an article written from very early on in the uh, pandemic um, by an, an author talking about touch saving her from loneliness. And she comes up with this incredible phrase, how do we live with this unbearable skin hunger? I think that's such an evocative phrase about the power of touch and how much we need that. I think for me, some of the most devastating images of lockdown were families outside of old people's homes, sort of touching through glass their uh, elderly uh, parents and also people dying in hospital and no one around them, and they could only communicate with loved, loved ones through an iPad or a screen. Absolutely heartbreaking. Um, yeah. So yeah, we need touch, absolutely. Uh, let's do a little bit of philosophy and research, just widening out a little bit. So here's a philosopher called Barry Smith. He writes about senses and smell particularly. He's got a funny guy. Uh, he says, uh, the sense we rely on most for reality is touch. It's very easy to get lost in thoughts and perceptions and to have a sort of overly creative fantasy world. To know something is real, we grab it, we touch it, we hold it. And this is a strong strand in philosophy that touch is an important uh, tool, one of the primary senses, the one, according to this philosopher, professor, the one we rely on most for touch. Shakespeare knew this. I grew up in Warwickshire, so Shakespeare is part of my history. Um, so Macbeth, one of the most famous scenes in theatre, Macbeth is contemplating murder. Uh, and he's having a vision. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, yet I see thee still. So he has a vision of a dagger, but he's not sure if it's real or not. Art thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight, or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation, proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? So he can't touch it and he gets the sense that it's a, um, a fantasy, a false creation. So he tries to clutch it to affirm that it's real and he can't do that. So yeah, very, I think a very famous statement um, that touching is the way that we confirm reality. There's long strands of this, so Descartes was a famous philosopher. His conclusion around reality was, I think, therefore I am. Herschel was an existentialist and sort of moved away from thinking as the primary way of knowing the world to the idea of a lived body that engages with the world and where tactile sensations are essential to the sense of sentience consciousness. 
So in our direct and immediate awareness of the body, we know it primarily through the tactile sensations involved in any activity of touching something. Knowing our body is knowing ourself, and we know our body through its engagements and touching and sensing of the world. So a very, very strong strand of philosophy that our engagement with the world is central to our understanding and experience of the world. The world touches us, and we know that we exist through this interaction. So therefore, we might change. I think, therefore, I am to I touch, therefore, I am. I have a body, therefore, I am. I interact with the world, therefore, I am. So I really love that sort of stuff. For me, the importance of touch as a primary experience that shapes who we are and as a way that we create and know and reaffirm reality, touch makes things real. Uh, I'm a kind of cranial sacral therapist, and we are very interested in early experiences. So for us, one of the biggest journeys and defining experience for human beings is the journey through the birth canal. So there's a whole field of pre and perinatal psychology, but we are shaped by experience and our early, one of our early defining experiences is being pushed and squeezed through the birth canal. We have this journey from floating in water and fluid with darkness and um, uh, very little sound or the sound of a heartbeat is our primary response. We get squeezed and pushed. Maybe we're pushing with our own legs. Maybe we're wriggling. Maybe we get help to get out, uh, uh, to complete that journey. And then we shift into a world of gravity, light, and we're touched and received. We have to feed and touch with our mouth to engage. That's a very powerful journey where all sorts of stimulus is happening. But all of that learning is mediated by touching a world and the world touching us. And other sentient beings, our caregivers, touching us and soothing us and regulating us after this massive ignition and movement of our body through the birth canal. I'm going to offer that all our early or very early learning experiences of what's safe, what's too much, of doing things on my own and I need to struggle to get out or I'm angry or frustrated by this process or I collapsed and I needed help or it was just too much for me or I got the perfect amount of help or that was hard and I know I can, that was horrible but I'm safe now. All that early learning is in the flesh and is informed by the world of sensation and the process of being touched and soothed. Safety is primed by our birth journey and our contact immediately after birth. Most attachment processes are involved touch. It's not psychological, it's physiological. All our learning concepts are laid down before we have words. Contemplation and words comes much later. From the age of three, we might start having linear timeline memories, but seven, eight, nine, it's really, there's so much has happened to us in terms of shaping our body and experiencing the world through touch. And all those experiences can be safe or dangerous and set up all sorts of concepts about what the world is or isn't. So I think our early learning is all formed through touch and is really, really important at a pre-conceptual, a pre-verbal level in the body. Let's look at a quote that supports that from a philosopher. So uh, I, Karen Lingard, who's a colleague in Australia, she's just written a new book. Uh, she put me onto some of the, these ideas around early learning and concept through formation through bodily gestures. Um, so the embodied patterns that emerge from experience our bodies from birth give coherent, meaningful structure to our physical experience at a preconceptual level. We have all sorts of inchoate, unknown events inside of us, all sorts of shapes and patterns that determine our whole experience of safety, interaction, and knowing what reality is, what's safe. Good. 
Let me stop the share, quick look at the chat just to see um, how we're doing. So if there's any questions here, just pop them in the chat and I'll see if I can um, reply or, or keep going. Just give me a couple of thumbs up or responses just to make sure that everybody's hearing and it's all going okay. Is there awareness in the tissues that touch? Uh, there's responses and local reflexes. Awareness I'm going to um, reserve for your big brain getting involved. So absolutely we can flinch before that information gets processed in the big brain. So we might have all sorts of responses um, from local sensations. But awareness, I think, involves the big brain and involves learning and, um, uh, you know, the higher functions of consciousness. Are these things healable and relearnable? Well, absolutely, yes. And we'll look more at that. Uh, the type of touch that might access this uh, unknown, hidden world of experience that happened through early life. Good, so the next section is inward touch and outward touch. So there's some geeky stuff here. I hope I'm gonna make it relevant to you. Um, it's putting some real detail into the, some of the philosophical statements and understanding the mechanics of touch. So the old model was that touch is one of the classic five senses. So all the way back from the Greeks, I believe there was this notion of five senses and touch was seen as one of them. Modern understanding is that we have more than five senses and touch is a complex perception that's never just isolated and alone. It's always made up of all sorts of other things going on. But we have things like balance, echolocation, proprioception, that's a quick sensing and a fiber type experience of a moving body in space. Proprioception allows me to touch my nose with my eyes closed. And we have interioception, which is I can close my eyes, hold my hand up, and I know that I have an arm even though it's still. So interioception is very closely related to these C fibers that we're going to explore right now. So different modes of sensing, far more than five senses, and touch is complex, not simple. So here's a quote. David Linden did a really great book on touch, 2015, highly recommended. Uh, there is in fact no pure touch sensation, for by the time we have perceived a touch, it has been blended with other sensory inputs, plans for action, expectations, and a healthy dose of emotion. Everything that's happening inside you contextualizes, modifies what your sense of touch. If you've got lots of stress hormones in you, your nerves will file, fire differently. If you're thinking about other things, your touch will be lower down the scale of what's important to you. If you're digesting your food, your touch experience will be different. If you have lots of inflammation and immune system overactivity, your touch information is processed differently. So touch as a complex experience, that's important to understand. There's no such thing as just a pure, separate, abstract touch that's separate from context. Here's a, a philosopher going deeper into this. The sense of touch is closely connected to bodily awareness. Body sensation is necessary for tactual perception. Many aspects of touch are primarily directed not at the external world, but at the present state of our bodies. I think this is such an amazing quote. So what's happening inside me, my bodily awareness, really informs and changes my experience of touch. And actually we have nerves that touch outward, slow C fibers we're going to learn, but also we have lots of slow C fibers on the inside of our body, our interioceptors, that are, we can usefully frame as touching inwards. So my ability to check the chemical activity in my body, my ability to check the states of fascia or the stretch in the organs as they fill up or empty, 
my ability to sense blood vessels and the stiffness or softness of my blood vessels. We could call this touching inwards because the nerves that sense our internal world, our interoceptive world, are directly related to and are processed in the same way and are affected by the nerves that sense and experience the external world, particularly the slow touch feature that we're going to explore. So we touch inwards and we touch outwards and the nerves that do that are basically the same things. So let's just do one feature of quick nerves and, and uh, slow nerves. So we have things called A fibers. This is a nerve bundle, a little bit like a telephone cable. Everything's bundled together in green, a bunch of fascia. And within the bundles of fascia, they're smaller bundles and then single axons. These single axons are tiny, but we have thick motorway nerves called A fibers. These were fairly easy to study and would have been studied for decades because you can see them on microscopes. They have very particular nerve endings, the encapsulated nerve endings, again, are quite big, and they carry far signals. Their signals are like going motorways. They're 50 times faster than the slower signals that go along C fibers. C fibers are like country lanes and paths. The C fibers are thinner. They have much less insulation. Here, every thick A fiber has lots of insulation. Insulation means the signal goes quicker. These C fibers are thinner. They're bundled together and they have less insulation and they're much, much slower. However, there's much, much more of the C fibers. So only 25% of the nerves are in fact, of the sensory nerves are in fact A fibers. Unmyelinated C fibers, the slow stuff is the majority of the sensory in mammals. C fibers are 50 times slower and carry gentle touch, providing the neurobiological substrate for the development and function of the social brain. So this is the McGone quote, the, the guy we looked at earlier from 2014. This was a landmark paper on touch, and he discovered these C fibers, he tested these C fibers, and found that they're really involved in social interaction and the assessing of emotion. Let's look at a, that's the C fiber one we've looked at. Uh, so his research into C fibers, these approaches have provided a pleasing correlation between psychophysical and electrophysiological studies. Slow stroking is perceived as most pleasant and C tactile fibers are tuned precisely to this frequency of slow stroking. So McGlone came up with this term effective touch mediated by C fibers. Effective is a word for emotion. He talks about as this type of touch as inherently a social gesture. Think of monkeys grooming each other and soothing each other and bonding and creating uh, alliances through the ability to groom and touch. This is how human beings, how mammals, how primates share uh, emotion by touching each other. This is really, really wonderful. Here's a researcher from another tradition, Dacha Keltner, who researches touch. Um, he writes a lot about emotion and he was looking at touch and can we communicate, what can we communicate through touch rather than using verbal clues? And he found that touch, my studies show, is the primary language of compassion, love, and gratitude, emotions at the heart of trust. Some of the experiments done by people like McGlone and Keltner involve people putting their hand through a rubber curtain. They can't see the, uh, the person on the other side of the curtain. They can't hear them, and uh, they don't know what's about to happen. The experimenter touches that arm and the person on the other side of the rubber curtain has to work out, is there an emotion being conveyed? And reliably, according to these researchers, 
Compassion is a, an uh, emotion that can be communicated through touch. And in fact, Keltner states that we're better at communicating passion, uh, compassion through touch than we are through verbal interactions or observing faces. Fantastic evidence. And I think those studies have been repeated a few times, the sticking the arm through a rubber curtain. We can convey lots of emotions through touch and some emotions actually better through touch than through other ways of interacting. This is just fantastic evidence for body workers. So we have slow C fibers that are country lanes and pathways. They're 75% of our sensory experience. They don't just encode the skin and the outside world. They're also sensing chemical changes, blood vessels, organs, the stretch in our blood vessels and organs, the, the chemical changes. We are touching inwards with slow C fibers and we have a slow touch system that touches outwards that's deeply, deeply important for conveying emotions and being a social animal. We're going to do a little bit more detail around these C fibers because they're extraordinary things. So first up, the nerve receptors. Here's a little bit of a finger and a bit of slice of skin. Here we have proprioceptive A fiber nerve endings. They get all sorts of fancy names, often named by men who arrogantly named bits of anatomy after them, unfortunately. Um, these things were very well studied, 1800s, 1900s. But free nerve endings, which are uncapsulated and just nerves with little membrane channels or ion channels at the end of them, these are really small. So small that they weren't very well studied until the last 15, 20 years. Francis McGlone was one of the people who studied the free nerve endings. These go along C fibers. Free nerve endings are basically just nerves with ion channels in them. Let's look at ion channels. Here's a thumb, here's a nerve, here's the spinal cord, and here's the nerve synapse. This bit's expanded here. So nerves connect to other nerves and they do that through a synapse. So there's a stimulus, an electrical signal goes along the nerve and that releases some chemicals, neurotransmitters into the synapse. And then the chemicals are soaked up by these things called ion channels. Here you can see the ion channels. Those free nerve endings here in C fibers are just ion channels that soak up chemicals in the circulating environment, in the fascia and under the skin and around all the cells of the body. So ion channels are really, really important folks. We used to think that ion channels were just sensitive at the ends of the nerve and uh, in the synapses. The new science is that ion channels are everywhere on a nerve. Here's a demonstration of that from uh, Antonio Damasio, again, a primary researcher into emotion. Here's the receptor of an A fiber, the receptor of an A fiber. A signal is coming in. The little red dots are the ion channels. They're picking up the signal and sending the information back into the spinal cord. If you notice, the blue is the myelination here. There's ion channels in the unmyelinated parts. If we go to the C fibers, we see that because they're not myelinated along the whole length, there's loads of ion channels along the whole length of the nerve. This means that stress hormones or inflammatory chemicals or danger information can be soaked up along the whole length of the nerve. A nerve isn't just sensitive at one end, a nerve is sensitive along its whole pathway. This is really, really amazing science. If you're stressed and dumping lots of cortisol into your body, your nerves are gonna soak up that cortisol and they're gonna work differently. Same with inflammatory markers. Your immune system can talk to C fibers and influence how the C fibers work. Really, really new science. 
let's look at ion channels because they're extraordinary things. So this is the outside of a cell. This is the inside of a cell. We have ion channels, lots of particular ion channels on nerves, but actually all cells have ion channels on them. So we have ion channels that respond to electricity. They're voltage driven, ones that respond to temperature, ones that respond to menthol like chemicals, one that respond to mustard or chili like chemicals ones that respond to acid, ones that respond to chemical pressure, ones that respond to inflammatory markers. You might know histamine or prostaglandins or serotonin and uh, other factors, nerve growth factors. So ion channels are being sensitive. To be a sensitive person basically means you have nerves that soak up chemicals and signals from mechanical damage, electrical change, and circulating chemicals. C fibers are the way that that information are carried from the periphery into the center of your body. So being sensitive is the activity in C fibers, responding to outside touch, responding to changes in our physiology on the inside. We touch inwards and we touch outwards with our C fibers and they're always working together. Here's a quote from pain researchers. Mosley and Butler are very influential pain researchers. They're talking about nociceptors. These are C fibers in effect, very shorthand, a simple way of saying C fibers. So uh, these type of C fibers, the action potential, that means the signal can be generated anywhere along a nociceptor. The ends of the nociceptor, so that's the normal state, what we used to think was the only place. However, we have action potential signals can be generated along the whole of the nerve, the nerve axon, the dorsal root ganglion, that's a collection of nerve bodies. Uh, we have uh, 62 mini brains along the spine, the dorsal root ganglions. Uh, so those are sensitive to pressure and where they synapse in the spinal cord we also are really malleable. There's lots of things happening in the spinal cord that modulate the signal. Keep breathing, folks. Just one last little bit of beautiful complexity that helps us understand how sensitive we are. Here's another picture of a nerve going from a hand into the spinal cord. What's nice about this one, though, is they're showing um, immune cell, a macrophage, communicating with the nerve. Here's an immune cell releasing chemicals that are being soaked up by ion channels and triggering a nerve to send a signal. This, I didn't learn this stuff at chiropractic college, that immune cells can talk to nerves. This is amazing stuff. And also we've learned there are immune-like cells in the spinal cord that modulate the synapse. Instead of just two nerves talking, which was the last picture, now we have immune cells affecting the signal within the spinal cord. Just fantastic. So keep breathing. I just wanna celebrate the complexity of the signals and the ion channels that affect nerves. Here's a blood vessel on the left with lots of immune cells. The immune cells all secrete different types of chemicals. We also have tissue damage or infection from bacteria that sends out signals. And our nerve has lots of different ion channels to soak up all those different chemicals. So being sensitive is having ion channels in nerves that soak up chemicals and read different events such as electricity and mechanical changes. If you think that's complex, wow, look at this one. Here's a nerve going into the spinal cord and then going up into the brain. There's loads of ion channels at the end of the nerve, loads of ion channels around the dorsal root ganglia loads of ion channels on the length of the nerve and loads of immune cells or immune-like cells within the spinal cord that are changing the signal. 
And this is before you get to hopes and dreams and fears mediated by your big brain. Oh my, extraordinary levels of complexity. We are really, really sensitive and nerves are the things that code our sensitivity. A lot of research around persistent pain is trying to modulate these factors and ion channels. But as you can see, it's incredibly complex science. Let's take a pause there. I hopefully that wasn't too complex. What I want you to get is we have slow C fibers that code slow stroking touch, but also those nerves are sensitive to circulating factors, stress hormones and immune cells. And that our sensing of our body is also through C fibers. So C fibers are being sensitive essentially. And we can touch and stimulate those C fibers by safe, emotional, social gestures to help people feel safe. Touch is primarily emotional. And if we do slow touch, it generates compassion, safety, it accesses that whole world of emotional sensitivity much more effectively than the motorway, quick podding, proking, trying to fix things type of touch to the limits of touch. So I've argued that touch is an early defining experience and that can change emotions and is a primary way that we know reality. So why aren't we all touching more? Well, we're scared of touch. Uh, and there's some good reasons for that, unfortunately. So touch in psychotherapy and talking treatments. This is a lovely book by Deb Dana. She explains our polyvagal theory. Uh, the first third of the book is great. I'm not so keen on the second two thirds. Gets a bit listy for me. But uh, she talks about touch as a therapeutic intervention is not commonly taught and is in fact often warned against. So working in trauma, which is one of the focuses of Deb Dana, as a talking treatment person, it's well known that touch is often uh, forbidden for talking treatment therapists. And here's a little bit more on that. This is a lovely paper. I'd highly recommend you look at this link. It's a long thing to read, but it really explores uh, in teaching profession and psychotherapy talking treatments when we can touch, why it's been a taboo and why uh, and some strategies to overcome it. We're going to look at a couple of slides from this paper. So they're just framing the taboo. In spite of the numerous, thera numerous therapeutic approaches, theories and practices that systematically and effectively use touch in therapy, touch has nevertheless been marginalized, forbidden, called a taboo. It's often sexualized and at times even criminalized by many schools of psychotherapy and ethicists. If you're going to do effective work, it's like that message on the tube I talked about. You shouldn't touch people. It's inherently dangerous, inherently leads to power imbalances and isn't the role of therapy because therapy is seen as talking because talking is the most important thing that human need, beings need to do to change their experience. But if, as I argue, that talking and language comes after all these fundamental experiences of safety, how do you access that in un on a non-verbal pre-conceptual level uh, without touch. That's the challenge for me. That's why I'm a body worker, because I believe that you can access all those early experiences and you can help people reshape, relearn that through skillful touch. Touch that recognizes that emotion can be conveyed through touch, particularly if done slowly and gently and appreciates a whole person. But we do need to honor that touch done badly can make people feel worse. It's such a powerful thing. And it's so closely towed with sex. And because there are examples of therapists and teachers tragically abusing their power, we've sometimes thrown the baby out with the bathwater and we've just forbidden touch in therapeutic situations. So this is just hard. Uh, it's really devastating. Um, my mum was a teacher, uh, head teacher, and I remember stories about how you'd have to organise people not being alone with children 
um, at, you know, in the 90s around just fear around touching because of all the scandals and understanding of sexual abuse and how frequently that was. So there are real things here and we do need to be very careful about touch. But I fear uh, that we've lost something by throwing touch out and sort of thinking that touch can never be used with people who've been through traumatic experiences. So how can we reclaim touch? Well, these are some points taken from research collated by Zur and Nordmarken. Nordmarken. So what type of touch can work? So first up, several factors have been found to significantly correlate with a client's positive evaluation of touch. There's clarity around the boundaries. So I'm a touch therapist, so people in my advertising, the therapeutic mode is known to include touch. So part of that, that's in the contract we make, that touch will be negotiated, but it's part of the tool that I use. And that's hard in psychotherapy because the contract is normally about talking, but sometimes it's possible to weave in reassuring gestures um, if you might advertise that or include that in your advertising as a talking treatment therapist. Touch that is positively evaluated by clients, it's congruent. That's kind of compatible and harmonious with their needs. Um, that the client has a sense of being in control so they can choose to say no, basically, and they know the purpose of the touch. Another thing is that the touch is perceived as being for the client's benefit not for the benefit of the therapist. That's a really important element. So, yeah, I think these are our very, very good starting place. Setting up a contract, making sure that it's clear, asking permission, making sure someone can always withdraw consent for touch, that it's compatible with what they need and with the uh, framework of your training as a therapist and that the touch is for the client's benefit, not for the therapist's benefit. So I think that's a really useful framework um, about how we can use touch in therapy. Touch that's done well, according to Zur and Nordemarken, uh, can have many positive outcomes. So here's some are expressed by clients who've experienced touch in psychotherapy. It provides a link to external reality Gosh, that takes us back to touch is one of the ways that we know we're real. We're lost in our mental processing. The talking is helping us understand, but it becomes talking and sort of internal processes. The touch of a therapist can help people come back to an external reality. How lovely, simple way of doing that. Touch can increase self-esteem in this context. And touch invites new experiences of relating to themselves and to other people. So this would be the benefits of touch in a psychotherapeutic situation where it's negotiated and with consent. Okay, so hopefully a little bit just to acknowledge there's a touch taboo that can be useful and necessary in psychotherapeutic circles, but also as a touch therapist, someone who works with trauma through touch, um, there are ways of negotiating that can be ethical, uh, consensual, and lead to very positive outcomes for people. Okay, let's look at another limit of touch. Touch doesn't work in the way that I was taught and most people understand it to work. So I was trained as a chiropractor. I used to do poking, prodding, stretching and manipulating. And I used to believe that I could diagnose the position of a bone or the position of a shoulder or the tear in a ligament through my skill with my hands. Unfortunately, all of that is probably not true. So first up, we can't, these are some panels from my book, uh, Touch is Really Strange. We can't reliably diagnose by touch. Interoperator reliability, where experts compare their diagnosis of say the position of a scapula or the tension in a muscle is very poor in manual therapy. If I assess the tension in a muscle, and someone else does that and someone else done that, we generally can't come up with very different uh, conclusions. Oh dear, yeah. Even if we could diagnose, we can't actually change tissues by locally focused touch. 
if you think you're poking, prodding, stretching, and breaking down of tissues by locally focused touch, and it's purely a local dynamic, that's not how it works. Touch only works because the big brain gets involved. The stimulus is perceived as safe that helps us come out of a contractile reflex and then the tissues change. The evidence for pure local dynamics changing the experience of the tissues is very, very poor. Here's a leading pain researcher, David Butler. We met him on ION channels. Soft tissue techniques work by changing the representation in the brain. We should use touch and movement to offer a nice, novel, safe input into the neuroimmune representation in the brain. From a leading physiotherapist saying that touch doesn't work by um, soft tissue techniques, but works by getting the big brain involved and changing our neuroimmune sensitivity, that's really quite radical, folks. That really pulls the rug out of lots of chiropractic, osteopathy, and physiotherapy philosophy. Wow. Let's keep going. Even if we could diagnose and then change the tissues, it doesn't really matter. There is a tsunami of evidence that better biomechanics, however defined, does not consistently lead to less pain. If your spine's straighter, it doesn't mean jack in terms of your pain experience. Oh dear, what's important is feeling safe and be moving regularly and not having fear responses to the sensations in your back. Straightness and alignment or the position of a joint or the stability of a joint turns out to be a minor effect in the pain experience. Far more, it's all these contextual messages of uh, meaning and safety and fear responses that are the biggest proportion of the pain experience. So the goal of touch should not be to change local dynamics. The goal should be a safe, meaningful stimulus to engage a person in their world. We touch whole people, not parts of people, always. If we acknowledge that, it is transformative. I never just touch a shoulder, I touch a person, a person with hopes and dreams and fears. And if they acknowledge that their hopes and dreams and fears are determinative of their sensitivity, their posture, their guarding, the way they move, then we need to meet that level because that's what determines the reflexes and the patterning and the inflammation and the stress response and their inner experience of their shoulder, for example. Here's another way of saying that. The old model. By breaking down scar tissue and adhesions through sports massage, we can restore function to the muscle and relieve the subsequent plays that they can cause. That's what I was taught. I used to rub till eight out of 10. 10 was the maximum pain people could endure. I'd be doing really strong rubbing to try and break down the scar tissue to locally change the dynamics of the tissue. It has an effect, but it's not a big effect on pain, certainly not the dominant effect according to current science. Here's another physiotherapist uh, celebrating, describing the new model of our new understanding. It is at last beginning to be more widely recognized that all manual therapy affects the tissues very little, if at all. We don't treat muscle, we don't treat fascia, we don't treat tendons, we treat people with nervous systems. I might add nervous and immune and hormone systems. Yeah, so stepping back, appreciating a whole person is really important. Slow touch can help us do that because slow touch is about early learning, compassion, has all sorts of shapes and patterns and coding and sensitivities associated with touching inwards, touching outwards, and all those slow C fibers. Yeah, Alex, uh, touch and therapy and psychotherapy provides a link to external reality. Yes, very much. I'd say that's an anti dissociation gesture as well. But more fundamental, well, as fundamentally as this notion of reality is confirmed by touching things. I trust that it's real because it's touched. I know that I exist because someone else touches me. Um, I interact with other human beings with a world that pushes back. Therefore, I am. 
Uh, Lindsay, how do you approach touch therapy with someone traumatized by touch? Yes, slowly, we need to um, acknowledge those larger dynamics. Uh, but first off, offer that it is possible, it is ethical, and it can be done. It might take time, and it might be slow journeys. It's never an imperative. We can do lots of work about uh, some people, you help them touch animals, or I've got clients who they do a daily walk and touching the horse is one of the ways that they kind of affirm it's safe to touch and interact with other sentient beings. So animals can be a good start. But within a therapeutic context, as a cranial psychotherapist, we teach you how to slowly negotiate that. Um, and some of those things that we talked about, consent, and um, it's for the client's benefit, that list is a good start to, uh, to, to doing all of that. Great. Yeah, Sue, it makes total sense. Uh, at the start of a CST treatment, you're touching their feet, but people have heat in their whole body or report an emotional shift. Absolutely. We now have some of the um, neurology behind that. The C fibers are waking up all sorts of systems in the body. Touch from the outside, C fibers works with touch on the inside and every system in the body will benefit from that boost of good news and safety. So relational touch, a new paradigm of touch. So we don't want to do this. This is George Bush at the time, uh, Angela Merkel, most powerful woman in the world. George Bush sneaks up behind her and gives her her terrible back rub. And you can see this immediate startle response from her. This generated a fear reflex, a contraction reflex, and uh, it's very, very obvious. So non-negotiated, non-consensual, surprising touch, um, and boom, we get fear responses generated. So clearly we don't wanna do this. Uh, I grew up with Star Trek, Dr. Spock, maybe was a cranial psychotherapist. Uh, idea of walking around the, um, the playground when I was a kid and used to do the Vulcan death grip, or you, know, you could knock someone out or learn something about someone by doing this, the, the touch of Dr. Spock. Uh, so yeah, Dr. Spock as a cranial psychotherapist, love that. Um, hugging as a powerful relational gesture. There's some really heartwarming videos and stories about free mom hugs and free dad hugs on LGBTQ events in North America over the last five, 10 years. The idea that elder figures who might represent parents and maybe for some of this community, LGBTQ, that parenting might have been difficult or they didn't get the gestures of support they, they might have wanted. And there were these mums and dads who were giving out these hugs and it became a real moment. Um, but really the power of hugs as a simple transformative gesture, uh, gosh. There's lots of good research on slow touch beginning to help people come out of pain. So not poking, prodding, not touch that's focused on local dynamics, but touch that meets a whole person. So here's one review of some, of some evidence on that. Hand holding supportive touch leads to less pain. The researchers evaluated the brain mechanisms behind the pain reducing effects of supportive touch defined as interpersonal touch with an intention of providing emotional support. So if you step away from, I'm gonna fix your joint, stretch your muscle, uh, take out the knots in the muscles and the tissues, if you come away from that philosophy and start touching with the notion of I'm meeting a whole person, I'm providing support, and that's always emotional, then that type of approach to touch can demonstrate less pain for people. Fantastic. If that pokey proddy quick A fiber does touch isn't so great, here's another paper summarizing the advantages of slow touch. So this paper, 2019, manual therapy exploring the role of human touch. A large amount of evidence has identified hands-on techniques as a pain modulator playing a role at multiple levels beyond the biomechanics. So at levels beyond the biomechanics, biomechanics is what I've been talking, what I've been framing as locally focused touch, aimed at changing the state 
uh, mechanics of the tissues. They're saying that uh, multiple touches are much more complex. And if you acknowledge these multiple levels, it will change pain. So what are the types of touch that come out of the research that do change pain? So first up, analgesic touch. That's a fancy name for counter stimulation, which is a fancy name for if your leg hurts and your mum comes along and rubs it hard, the pain goes away. So, or if you've got an itch and you rub it hard, then the itch goes away. So you counter stimulate. If you put a new sensation in, it'll turn off the pain sensation. So counter, counter stimulation is an old school technique. If you rub it, it'll go away. And uh, yeah, that's definitely uh, a model. We distract by counter stimulation. We uh, A fiber signals can sometimes override C fiber signals. So the quick signal will dominate and switch off the slow uh, danger type signal. Good. Effective touch. That's this whole territory of C fibers. Touch supports interoceptive awareness. That's the inner touching, the homeostasis, the events in the body by activation of C fibers. This is inherently about a much emotion. So touch needs to be sympathetic to work. Who knew? It's kind of, I mean, these are, these are physiotherapists writing. Uh, the idea that a physiotherapist needs to be sympathetic to generate a positive outcome. It's not rocket science, is it really? But, uh, and I know this because I was trained as a chiropractic. I wasn't working with a person. I was working with a spine. And my focus was the spine, not the person. And it's very easy to forget about the person when you're focused on the biomechanics. We lose our ability to be empathetic and sympathetic in those contexts. Great. So the other type of touch that this uh, research says works well to turn pain, turn off pain is somatal, somato perceptual touch. This is this notion of touch that changes the representation of the body. So by touching someone, I help them know that they're real. I help them come out of dissociation. I help them find the size, shape, weight of their body. I put in a new stimulus that gives them a sense of boundaries and edges and safety. Touch that was horrible is perceived as always disgusting and I need to move away from it. We're gonna change the memories, the stories, the representation of that touch and help people find joy and ease in connecting to their body through using toe touch, slow touch to improve the maps, the representations they have of their body. So yeah, this is a nice overall model that even if biomechanically focused touch isn't great, we still have very clear evidence that counter stimulation, slow interoceptive awareness, and touch that helps us feel our body and represent our body more effectively, this type, these bundle, these ways of understanding touch uh, help us turn off pain. Excellent news. Let me just summarize this. Um, the old model. Touch works by changing local tissue dynamics. Touch is secondary to language, emotion, and concepts. The new model, touch is fundamental, is of fundamental importance to our sense of self. Touch can be a safe, novel stimulus to a stuck organism. Relational touch has the potential to switch off protective reflexes and promote learning and growth. I'm a body worker because I believe that relational touch can access those early learning patterns, can help us rediscover or sometimes find for the first time a sense of joy and ease inside of us. I think because early learning is so founded in touching a world that pushes back and touches us, about learning safety through being soothed and, and held, because our early learning experiences are so deeply entwined with those early touch experiences, that touch is the best way, the simplest way, the quickest way, the most effective way to help people come back into safe embodied reality, where their body is a home and not an enemy where reality is my ability to occupy the space bounded by my skin, to feel agency and joy and power in my body, 
And that leads to clear thinking, clear emoting, clear memories, because I have clarity in the relationship to my body. Let's take a pause and just see if any questions come through. Uh, got about 10, 15 minutes left. I'll do a little bit more about biodynamics and cranial work. But let's just take a pause and see if there's any questions from people around the material we've covered. Yeah, uh, someone who's had difficult touch, self-touch is a great start for that. So putting a hand on a beating heart or using a hand to tune into a belly or a hand on a painful area or just giving yourself a, um, a hug or doing some self slow stimulation. All of these slow touch, safe touch models, uh, helping people touch themselves is a great way of working. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a sort of, uh, um, there's lots of things going on in the idea of distance healing and distance cranial psychotherapy. I'm not a huge fan, to be honest. I think cranial work is a touch therapy and uh, we, we betray the roots of cranial work when we try and do distance work. Um, so yeah, for me, cranial work is founded in touch. It's always about touch. We lose far more than we gain by taking our hands off. Absolutely, we have a shared perceptual space and that's meaningful and how uh, your body will mimic my body in a shared perceptual realm, whether that's over the internet, you can see me and hear me, or we're in the same room together. Our bodies mirror what we perceive, but uh, touch adds to that. It means that we can communicate, can make compassion. Uh, we can be social animals. We, social animals, we can regulate through touch. And we do that far more powerfully than just being, in a, being uh, attempting to do that at a distance. Are there statistics about whether touch to the self is as powerful as receiving from someone else? I think we can do a lot of good work on, us, on our own. We can learn to meditate. We can learn to, to experience our body. We can move on our own. And please get good at that. There's a huge amount we can do for ourselves. The data, I don't know, but theoretically, I just deeply believe we're social animals and doing it all on your own is hard. And we exist in relationship and we exist in relationship to other humans. Actually, they're the primary source of safety and danger for us. So, yeah, you can do it all on your own, but it's frequently hard and impossible to do that. Sometimes we need a guide or we need someone who can safely show us that touch can lead us back into our bodies and lead us back into a sense of safety. So whilst I do want people to move and do personal work and meditative work and self-touch, um, we heal in relationship and it's nearly always about communities that exist together and sometimes finding individual relationships that can support you. And I think that's more powerful than doing things on your own. Yeah, Ashley, curious about working with people who self-harm. Would this harmful touch to them? Yes, because they're breaking the integrity of their body. Would that be considered counter-stimulation? On some level, yes, we might weave that model in. We're talking about using counter-stimulation to turn off pain, but maybe the emotional pain of not knowing I exist. There's good evidence of dissociation, a kind of uh, a withdrawal reflex being quite a common part uh, uh, quite a common feature of people who self-harm and um, so I don't know that I exist I'm dissociated I've withdrawn my body feels alien and separate from me and there are a bright red scream is a book I remember from 10-15 years ago talking about how people only know they exist by cutting open their skin and seeing the blood bleeding out or having a very strong pain experience to overcome the horror of non-existence and not knowing or not having a sense of their body so yeah that's stretching the meaning of counter stimulation in that context but i thought that kind of relates to what you're saying um yes can visualizing compassionate touch be effective uh, i guess i don't know um we are very strong um yes uh, absolutely um we are extraordinary as human beings and that our imagination can lead our physiology. If you lie down and think about something horrible, your heart will start racing and your belly will contract and your muscles will get tight. And if you lie down and think about something wonderful, 
uh, often actually one of the biggest things to remember is gratitude, receiving gratitude or something that you've overcome. And gratitude is a really great word to weave into your um, imaginal remembering world. Uh, yes, that would be a very powerful way of activating all sorts of good things. Okay, well, thanks for the uh, questions. I'm going to just move on to talk a little bit about cranial work. So uh, we have two really important concepts in cranial work. Uh, one is that there's all sorts of rhythms in the human being. So we have heart rates, we have twitching of tissues, we have guts that churn, we have rhythms in our brain, we have uh, blood pressure waves, we have waves of fluid moving around our nervous system. We're also embedded in bigger rhythms. We have circadian rhythms where we secrete immune cells at four o'clock in the morning, uh, immune uh, chemicals peak at four o'clock in the morning. We have hormones that are secreted daily and over weeks and months. So we have rhythms within rhythms within rhythms, rhythms inside us, rhythms in, outside of us in nature, day, night, months, years, cycles and seasons. Rhythms are a fundamental feature of human beings. There's a slow pulse of being human. Sometimes all these internal rhythms can coalesce into uh, a meaningful, beautiful tune. So we might say that health is playing more beautiful music on the inside of us. Our rhythms are working together. When they're working together, we're communicating. All those sensitive systems mediated by C fibers and chemical expression, all those secretions are working together and there's harmony in the body. So very much for cranial work, the experience and the sensitivity to internal rhythms is a fundamental feature that we can teach you how to pay attention to, the deep pulse of being alive. We have various rhythms that we have learned to really honor and that are seen as significant in cranial work. There's a basic rhythm recently, a really great study on the rhythmic movement of bones in the skull showed that there's a rhythm independent of heart rate, independent of breathing at about six cycles per minute. Really great evidence for us that really um, uh, reinforces the original insights of the founder of cranial work, Sutherland. So we have rhythms in bones moving in our body, and that's probably, we have sort of some quicker rhythms, much slower than your heart rate, much slower than your breathing. Breathing's about 20 times a minute, heart rate 50, 60 times a minute. Slow movements of bones, six times a minute maybe, and that varies. We have a slower rhythm that we call mid-tide, that's about two and a half times a minute. And we have an even slower rhythm called long-tide, that's really stable, that's about once a minute. Uh, well, uh, one minute up, one minute down, very roughly. So the ability to differentiate, pay attention to rhythms is one of the skills that we'll teach you in this slow touch work. We'll put our hands on, our hands will be soft, still and gentle. All the work touching cranial work is gentle touch. We're not moving and poking. We're not trying to get A fibers and doing quick stimulus. We're trying to access that social effective touch and we use feather light still hands. And one of the big things we perceive is this sense of a rhythmic pulsing body and the quality of the pulsing, which bits of the body are pulsing, where the rhythms are expressed. For us, that's our diagnostic territory. We'll give you a framework to interpret that and how to interact with the rhythms, how to support more coherence, more communication, how to support things that aren't slowly pulsing and expressing this rhythm, that aren't connected to the whole rhythmic flow and uh, feeling inside the human being. We'll teach you how to support things that are out of communication, that are disconnected, to come back into harmony and rhythm. And we do all of that by slow, gentle touch. So that's the first core principle. 
There is rhythm inside human beings that we can influence, and we do that by slow, gentle touch. The other defining principle about cranial sacral therapy is that humans are self-organizing organisms. Just as you cut your finger, you know it's going to heal and self-repair. That's a principle of self-organization and an emerging intelligence within an organism. The smartest thing in the room is the intelligence in our bodies. If we create enough safety, all our self-healing mechanisms will begin to kick in because there's resources and safety and a relationship that can facilitate that. It's a bit like the therapist is the reference point, reminding your body of these slower rhythms and reminding the body, creating a safe environment. I can rest, I can repair, I can start meeting the things that are difficult and begin to include them and find a way of uh, healing, becoming less sensitive, of, of reducing the things that are too much, meeting them with resources and safety, sometimes a support from another person, and allowing that thing to not be walled off, disconnected and wrong, and somehow uh, promoting healing as integration and communication in the body. So an intelligent body that self-organizes and a body that has full of rhythms. And we use slow, gentle touch to support that. Cranial work is deeply informed by the understanding of early experiences such as birth. We are shaped by experience and birth is an early defining experience. Cranial work is also deeply informed by trauma and the understanding that uh, we can dissociate, we can withdraw, we can shut down as a gesture, and this really, really affects the ability to express rhythms in our body. We can also speed up to survive, so we're full of speed and tension and quick rhythms. We have all sorts of verbal skills to support the uh, touch skills, but very much a trauma-informed practice um, is just central to the understanding of how we touch Safety is the most important thing human beings need, and we'll give you lots of tools to help you negotiate safe, meaningful touch for people. We're also informed by embryology. How we grow is how we heal. We also do lots of great anatomy. Anatomy is a language of the body, language of the body, not the bottom. Anatomy is the language of the body. We'll teach you how to speak that language, how to sense what's on your hands and how to pay attention to that and how to support the physiology to engage. So we'll study immune system, nervous system, we'll study structure, we'll study joints, we'll study organs, we'll study fascia, all ways of intelligently asking questions of making suggestions to a whole person. Yeah, so lots of verbal skills, deeply informed by trauma, deeply informed by our understanding of birth and deeply informed by philosophies of interconnectedness and a principle of non-doing, the idea that we need to create conditions where the self-healing mechanisms, the principle of life organizing itself can express itself. Um, it's a really beautiful way of working. It's completely changed. I've been doing this work for 20, 25 years now, it's completely changed my understanding of the world. I think it's a really beautiful, elegant way. I don't do the quick, dramatic stuff these days. I find it's far quicker, more clinically efficient to get the body to do the work for you. We create the conditions through safe, gentle touch that appreciates these rhythms and people reorganize from the inside without me imposing something on their experience. Very meditative work. So we'll do a lot of tuning in to your own body, learning what you can feel on the inside of you. And from the act of presence, we can help other people be more present to themselves and more present to the world. So yes, a very strong meditative tradition um, as part of biodynamic cranial sacral therapy. Aidan, I was a bit overwhelmed at the start of the Turk with all the nerve diagrams and biological terms. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, hopefully we'll try to make it simple. Um, I'm a bit geeky around that stuff, and I wanted to do 20 minutes or so of some detailed stuff. Um, the anatomy, there'll be bits of it, but uh, hopefully we'll make it simpler. That's quite complex for me as a lecture to give out. 
uh, but will attempt to make the technical stuff meaningful for you. The core of the course is experiential, you feeling your own body, you receiving treatments and you giving treatments. So no, you don't need to worry too much about all the technical stuff. There'll be a little bit, but uh, generally we don't overwhelm people with uh, anatomy uh, and technical stuff. Thank you, folks. If you want to find out more about training, bodycollege.net. Uh, we're starting a course in Ireland in Galway in October and a course in London in October. Um, otherwise, there's lots of good resources on bodycollege.net. The recording of this lecture will be sent out if you're registered so you can watch it again at your leisure. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'll send out a bit of a feedback form. If you could give me some feedback or when the video is up on Vimeo, uh, just give it a like. That's really helpful for me just to get people interested and getting a bit of buzz around it. Huge thanks for tuning in and uh, I hope it makes sense and good luck using slow, gentle touch to communicate emotion and maybe really know that is a really powerful way of reaffirming your humanity and of connecting to yourself and connecting to other people. Slow, gentle, effective, emotional touch is an amazing lever to help you feel more real and to help the people around you feel more real. Thanks for tuning in.